Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club and to another of the online programs that the club has been doing during the virus crisis. Uh, the club has produced over a hundred of these live stream programs since we all started staying at home, and we hope you've been enjoying them. All of them are available for viewing on the club's website, its YouTube channel, and its Facebook page. And today I have the pleasure of talking with Alan Mikhail, the author of this book, God's Shadow, Sultan Selim and the making, his Ottoman Empire and the making of the modern world. Alan is an award-winning author of four books and over 30 scholarly articles in the fields of Middle Eastern and environmental history. 
He teaches history at Yale and is also the chairman of the Department of History there. So we're delighted to have him with us today. Alan, welcome. Thanks, Adam. It's great to be with you virtually. Uh, I wanted to say just before we begin how fascinating I found this book, which somewhat surprised me because I'm very much a modern history guy. I had never read anything about the Ottoman Empire. I didn't think that I was going to be fascinated by it, and I didn't think I would see as many connections and echoes of today's world as I found in the book. So I really want to get into um, some of those things when, when we get talking. Uh, why don't we begin, though? You've got a couple of pictures that will give us some idea of what the extent of the Ottoman Empire was in the time that we're talking about, and also show us an image of Sultan Selim, who's your uh, central character. So why don't we just take a look at those uh, to begin with? Sure. So um, the Ottoman Empire... The rough dates that we should have in mind are 1300 to World War I. So we already see that this is 600 years, um, an enormous expanse of time, the longest lasting empire in Islamic history, one of the longest lasting states in world history, one of the largest states geographically at its height. Um, and that expansion is a central part of my book since Salim is the one who undertakes it. Um, for um, about the first uh, 200 uh, years of the empire's history. Um, it's an empire really of the Balkans and West um, Anatolia. Uh, you see that outlined on the map here. 1453 is a canonical date um, when the Ottomans conquer Constantinople, um, connecting these two halves of the empire, what were two halves before the Balkans and Western Anatolia. And then in 1517, they conquer what we conventionally think of as the Middle East today, um, into North Africa, the Levant, and into uh, the Red Sea. And they roughly have that shape, losing some territory, gaining some territory, until, uh, until uh, World War I. And then we have a picture of Sultan Selim. Right. So um, this is, um, you know, one of the famous um, uh, miniature paintings of uh, Selim with his uh, telltale mustache, as you see. Um, he's the, the character, the central character, as you said, um, around which the book is built. He lives from 1470 um, to 1520 um, and takes over the, the throne in 1512. Um, so even though he has a short number of years on the throne, eight years, he, um, you know, has all kinds of um, um, world-shaping impacts that I'm sure we'll get into. And there was one more image there that went by quickly. Can we go back to that one? So this is this is Selim's uh, coronation in um, 1512, after he deposes his father and um, eventually will dispatch his uh, half brothers. The coronation of any sultan, of course. Uh, of any royal is, uh, is a major event in the life of the empire. Okay. Well, let's start in on the book. One of the things that intrigued me was that you started the book with the name of a town on the U.S.-Mexican border. Tell us about that and what it says about this time 500 years earlier. That's right. So uh, the, the town is uh, Matamoros, um, today on exactly on the Texas-Mexico Mex Texas border. Um, it's been a town uh, that has been prominent in um, stories of immigration that we've all been familiar with over the past couple of years. Um, the name of this town is what interests me. Meta, from the Spanish matar, is to kill. Moros is the uh, derogatory name for Muslims, Moors, our Moors. So um, Matamoros is a Moor slayer. So I'm curious as to why there would be a town on the Texas-Mexico Texas border with the name Moor slayer. Um, and I ascribe that to uh, the period of the book, the period of Selim's reign, when the Ottomans um, and other Muslim powers around the Mediterranean are locked 
um, in commercial relations, but also in, in military confrontations with Christendom. Um, and for me, a central aspect of, of the global impact of the Ottoman Empire is understanding how that old world conflict between Islam and Christendom shaped um, the new world. And that brings us to another fascinating thing I found about the book, which is that although this is a book about the Ottoman Empire in the years uh, 1470 to 1520, uh, there's a great deal in it about something else that happened exactly during that time, which is Christopher Columbus and his voyages to the New World. Tell us about those connections. That's right. So um, this this is probably the, the most fascinating part of the book for me, um, is, is thinking about the real consequences of Islam for Christopher Columbus, part of his biography that we usually miss. Um, he's born in 1451 in Genoa, so just a few years before the Ottomans take Constantinople in 1453. Um, and, and that moment um, really sears in the uh, Catholic psyche this notion that Islam is in the ascendancy in the Mediterranean and pushing further and further west. So Columbus really imbibes this kind of view of the world very early on in his life. Genoa has commercial relations as a mercantile state in the Black Sea and in the Eastern Mediterranean. And after 1453, um, the Ottomans basically cut off their access um, to the Black Sea and then a little bit later um, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, so there's this sense again of, of loss to Islam. It's also a crusader port. So he would have been familiar with crusaders um, going to um, the Holy Land to try to conquer Jerusalem. Um, he was raised on the stories of Marco Polo, who would have told him about the great Khan of the East that lived in some vague place in Asia that maybe had interests in converting to Christianity to surround Islam, crush it, and take Jerusalem. Um, some of the earliest voyages when he goes to sea as a teenager take him um, to parts of the Muslim world. So he works as a, a, a sailor for hire um, for um, um, a French king. One of the French king's ships is captured and taken to Tunis. Um, and Columbus is part of the expedition that goes to try to retrieve that ship unsuccessfully. Um, he also um, takes a voyage to Chios um, as part of a um, trading expedition uh, to try to get mastic from Chios, one of uh, the only places on earth where mastic grows Remind naturally. Us where Chios is? Chios is uh, a, a now Greek island in the Aegean, just off of the Anatolian coast. Um, so he goes in the 1470s, and there he's regaled with these tales um, about the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople. Um, many soldiers from Chios went to fight um, as part of Byzantine forces against the Ottomans. Um, so being in Chios, um, coming um, to the port of Tunis, Islam comes alive for him for the first time in his life. Um, the story of him searching out for a patron is one that's quite well known. Um, part of that story puts him in Spain um, during the moment in which Isabella and Ferdinand are waging the Reconquista. So he's part of, the, of, the, of this, this military effort to um, unite in Catholic terms um, all of Spain. So. All of these experiences um, with the Muslim world, with Muslims real and imagined, helped to shape his worldview, helped him um, to understand the world as one in which um, Muslims are pushing further and further west in the Mediterranean, perhaps gobbling up um, some of Spain's outposts in North Africa. Um, and this comes to a head on the very first page of his travel log as part of the Atlantic voyages. He says, that um, after you, my sovereigns, Isabella and Ferdinand, captured uh, the fortress of Granada and expelled um, uh, the last Muslim state from the peninsula, only then did you decide to send me west to try to find uh, the king of India. So um, I understand that passage as one in which he puts these two things together, the Reconquista, the defeat of Islam in Spain, and the Atlantic voyages. 
I think both professional historians and um, in our own popular imaginations, we don't tend to think of those things together. We tend to think of the Atlantic voyages as a new beginning in world history, a turning point. Yeah. Um, or we think about 1492 as the moment when the Jews are expelled from Spain. Um, eventually, um, all Muslims will be expelled from the peninsula as well. Um, but these two things really go together for Columbus. So I wanted, to, I wanted to hold them together in telling this story, to understand something of what this millennial encounter between Islam and Christianity meant for the Atlantic voyages. So we all know that he sailed west uh, hoping to find India and not knowing that uh, the Americas were in his way, so to speak. But what was new to me, and I learned from your book, was the idea that there, there was this mythical great Khan, some great ruler, uh, supposedly in India, right, who was interested in converting to Christianity, and that Columbus thought of part of the purpose of his voyage would be to find this guy and acquire him as an ally against mm -hmm. the Ottomans, right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where, where right. did this legend of the great Khan come from? So he gets it from Marco Polo. Um, there, there are historical reasons as to why this myth exists. So um, namely Nestorian Christians. So, so, so there, are, there are some small group of Christians um, in what is today China and parts of Central Asia in this period. Um, there, there, there's this very old rumor that, that Marco Polo picks up on and then sort of popularizes that the leader of this group of Christians who is their sovereign, who is not a Christian, um, nevertheless has learned from these people um, and has an interest in converting to Christianity as Polo and Columbus understand it, again, because they have a religious worldview, um, because he's, he's been opened up to the glories of, of Christianity. But wasn't Marco Polo, he was a century or two before Columbus, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Right. But Columbus reads Marco Polo's uh, um, journals when he's... So when he's is the thought that the sovereign's son, grandson, great-grandson or whatever might still be interested in converting to Christianity? Yeah. That's right. The, this, this mythology is both an old one and a current one in, uh, in Columbus's time. It, it also points us to the fact that, um, you know, often... Columbus is narrated as a story of um, scientific discovery, of um, you know geographical expertise, um, but it, th there's a whole mythology here that that makes no sense um, a, a, as as we're discussing at some level, um, and we have to keep that in mind, right? Columbus, again, from the ancients um, through uh, medieval writers, thinks that um, you know when he is in far off lands that he's going to meet humans with dog heads and people who have faces in their chests and all these kinds of things. So, so th this is baked into the worldview in this mm -hmm. period. Yeah. I was fascinated though, that the, that myth was strong enough that he took with him on that first voyage speakers of Middle Eastern languages. Cause they, that's right. Yeah. These would be people who spoke Arabic or more yeah. Indian languages, Hindi? So uh, Chaldean, uh, which is the language of the Nestorians, um, um, Aramaic, Arabic, and Hebrew. Um, so the, the, you know, the great languages of the ancient world as Europeans understood it. Um, so these folks were on the three ships, but didn't find anybody with whom to speak those languages there. That's right. That's yeah. right. And, um, you know, that's another sign of just how important um, this uh, this encounter with the East, um, not just Islam, but you know, a vague sense of an East is for someone like Columbus. Yeah. Um, when they arrive, you know, one of the most remarkable things is that um, he he and others, other conquistadors of that generation, um, see Islam in various kinds of ways. Yeah. Cortez thought he saw a mosque, uh, a mosque, right? That's right. Cortez in what is today Mexico. Uh, says that he sees 400 mosques. Hmm. Um, most likely he's, he's referring to Aztec temples. Yeah. He refers to Montezuma as a sultan. Um, Columbus describes indigenous women in the Caribbean as looking like Moorish women, Muslim women. Uh, he describes their dress in similar sorts of terms. Um, so 
you know, that, I think that's an obvious example of the importance of Islam for shaping, um, for shaping these people. And then also for, for our understanding of the early, you know, European colonization of the Caribbean. Let's go back to the Ottoman Empire itself as it existed during this time. Um, you point out that it spanned three continents, which is something that I guess I knew from looking at a map, but just didn't quite think of what the meanings of that were. And one of the meanings, as you point out, is that at the beginning of this period, you're writing about the majority of its inhabitants were Christians. Mm -hmm. That's right. So from 1300, the beginnings of the empire, until 1517, when Selim conquers the Mamluk Empire and more than doubles the territory of the empire, the majority of subjects of the empire are Orthodox Christians, um, remnants of the Byzantine Empire. It's only in 1517, once they conquer um, most of the Muslim Middle East, that the majority of people who live in the empire will be Muslims. And it sounds like the Muslims were rather nicer to the Christians than vice versa in this period. They weren't trying to convert them, right? They, it was the Christians who were a little closer to being jihadists, in, both in the, in the sense of waging the Crusades, and also they did believe strongly in converting people that they conquered, right? That's right. So in the book, um, in a chapter that I... Um, provocatively, obviously, um, entitled um, Catholic Jihad, um, I, I draw a contrast between the situation of Jews and Muslims in Spain and um, Jews and Christians in the Ottoman Empire. So it is the case that um, um, in, in Spain, uh, the Catholic powers are interested in converting non-Christians uh, to Christianity, often through force. Um, in the Ottoman Empire, the, um, the mode of rule is more that minority religious groups should recognize the sovereignty of um, the Muslim rulers of the Ottoman Empire. Um, they do have to pay a, a, a poll tax. Um, they do have a, a lesser status, for example, in court cases to give evidence in court, things like that. Um, but there's no wholesale effort to try to forcibly convert um, Christians and Jews in the Ottoman Empire akin to something that we see in Spain. This changes over time, um, and, and um, I don't want to say that it was always this way, but but for the in very broad brushstrokes, this is the case, um, certainly um, in the 50 years of Salim's life. If anything, the, the sort of enemies of um, Sunni Muslims are Shiite Muslims um, in this period, and that's a very important part of, of Salim's life. Yeah. So in a way, this was a tolerant empire. Um, if we can use tolerance of a time when everybody, Christians included, practiced slavery and beheaded their enemies and so forth. But nonetheless, the idea of tolerating people of different religions living under your political rule, uh, I think does let us use that word. Do you think that had to do that had a lot to do with the longevity of the empire? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a couple of reasons. One, one is long, longevity, certainly, and understanding that um, the best means for stability in a um, multi-confessional, multilinguistic, multi-ethnic ethnic empire is um, to give some amount of autonomy, community autonomy, um, religious group autonomy um, to, to people within the empire. Again, as long as they recognize the sovereignty of the empire and don't challenge that. Um, so it, it's, an, it's a, a means towards an end of rule uh, for, um, for the Ottomans. Uh, this is true of other empires as well. Um, I think there's also an answer um, in, in um, in the religious sources, so Islam is the last of the three major um, um, Middle Eastern monotheistic religions of the region. Um, it has to, in some ways, wrestle and deal with Christianity and Judaism in a way that the other two don't. Mm -hmm. um, many Christian and Jewish saints are saints in Islam. Um, so that Islam was always um, emerging with the other religions. Um, and having to sort of reconcile itself to Christianity and Judaism. So, so the Ottomans inherent that 
in, um, in, in a kind of way in their understanding of the world. That's interesting. That, that could be what, one of the things that makes for this greater tolerance. Um, before we get to Salim, uh, I, just give us a sense of how this empire spread over such a vast area, and especially when Salim enlarged it by essentially uh, conquering uh, you know, the, much of the Mediterranean coast of North Africa and, and the eastern end of the Mediterranean. How did it function? What was the language in which things took place? Was it uh, sort of an earlier version of modern Turkish? Was that written in Arabic script? I'm just trying to get a feel for how it operated. How do they communicate? Was there a postal service or was it mm -hmm. messengers riding back and forth? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so the, the Ottomans um, come closest to any of the Mediterranean states um, to uh, replicating the size of the Roman Empire, the paradigmatic empire of the Mediterranean. So at the height of their rule, thanks to Selim, um, they, they control the Mediterranean from Morocco all the way around to Albania, um, in the Middle East to Iraq, um, up into the Balkans to Bulgaria and Romania, um, down the west coast of the Arabian Peninsula. So a huge expanse of territory, um, uh, tens of millions of individuals who speak many different languages, as you're saying. Um, the language of imperial rule was Ottoman Turkish. So Ottoman Turkish is an older version of modern Turkish. It's written in the Arabic script. Um, it was Ataturk who quote unquote modernized um, um, Turkish in the 20th century to give it the Latin script. Um, that, so so the, the language of rule at the imperial level is Ottoman Turkish, but at the local level, it's, it's, it's the vernacular of that area. Hmm. So when you read, um, court records, for example, from Bulgaria, they're in Bulgarian, mm -hmm. um, from, um, you know, what is today Libya, for example, they'd be in Arabic, um, in Anatolia, they would be in Turkish. Um, and, and so the Ottomans, again, um, are, are in some ways very keen on meeting their subjects halfway, if you like, mm -hmm. of um, providing them with the trappings of imperial rule in their, in their um, um, localities. Um, to show them that uh, there can be many benefits and advantages to Ottoman rule, so um, um, so that they will, you know, be pliant subjects to the empire. Um, but to really to really move up in the empire, to enter the military, or to even enter the political ranks, one would really have to learn Ottoman Turkish. Um, and so we have plenty of examples of people coming from the Balkans or from um, you know Arabic-speaking places. Um, to Istanbul, and they would be learning Ottoman Turkish um, to be able to communicate with uh, with um, the elite of society in the capital. And communications, how did that, was there a post office? What, what, how did that work? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. I actually, I had a PhD student who just wrote a dissertation on the Ottoman postal system. Huh. Um, um, so there is a postal system. Um, um, it was run uh, by a horse courier. Um, um, it, there is a, a very involved road system in the Ottoman Empire, um, and um, the road system has to be protected um, precisely be for matters of communication. Um, you know, uh, news can only move as fast as the, a horse or someone's feet. Um, so it's very important that um, roads be protected to allow horses and people to move freely. Um, so one of the, the worst um, um, crimes in the Ottoman Empire is theft on the road. So those who attack travelers or pilgrims are, um, are, are prosecuted to, to the highest extent of the law in, in the Ottoman Empire. So tell, tell us a bit about Sultan Selim, uh, whom this book is about. Born in 1470, right? Right. And his mother right. was a slave, right? That's right. Um, so... His mother um, is a concubine. Mm -hmm. um, all, nearly all Ottoman princes and therefore Ottoman sultans um, are the sons of Ottoman royal men and um, concubine slave women um, who had their origins in, in many different kinds of places. Um, some the Balkans, some uh, Southern Russia, Ukraine, some the Caucasus, etc. cetera. Um, 
uh, Selim is born in Amasya, which is a landlocked um, city in the middle of Anatolia. Um, and is uh, his father at that time, Bayezid, is a prince. Um, his grandfather is Mehmet the Conqueror, the Sultan who conquers Constantinople. Um, and Selim moves uh, to the capital city, Istanbul, in 1481, when his father takes over the throne. So the whole family moves. Um, Selim is the fourth of his father's 10 sons. Um, he is not a favored son. Um, the favored son is the eldest surviving son, um, favored to take over the throne. Um, nevertheless, and I trace this in some detail in the book, um, he's able to turn some of his disadvantages into advantages. Um, and that's, that's really where his mother plays a, um, a, a really important role. In the classical Ottoman system of, of um, family politics, once a concubine gives birth to a boy, uh, sexual relations between the sovereign and that concubine ends. Mm -hmm. um, and there is this phrase, one woman, one son, whereby the mother and the son become a kind of duo um, to try to maneuver to get the son on the throne. Um, being the mother of a sultan, of course, comes with it many advantages. That sounds a little bit like the Saudi Arabian royal family today, <laughs> with conflicts among all these half-brothers. Right. I mean, um, we see this kind of thing um, in, in, in many dynasties around the world. So in, in, in China and Japan as well. I, actually, a in, in a, yeah. a Rupert Murdoch's family as well, to talk about <laughs> another kind of empire. <laughs> One, One of my friends, um, my, one of my friends um, jokingly refers to, you know, the Trumps as a kind of Ottoman uh, yeah. dynasty. Yeah, we won't go there. But um. <laughs> yeah. So then he did come out on top and he became right. Sultan in what year? In 1512. And he had only a few years to live, but he greatly expanded the empire during that time. That's right. So... Um, in those eight years, he spends very little time actually in the palace in Istanbul. Mm -hmm. um, his, just after winning the throne, his first military expedition is to um, dispatch his half brothers who remain rivals uh, for the throne. Um, so he chases them down in Anatolia, kills them in 1513. Um, and then in 1514, leads his armies all the way across Anatolia um, to battle the Safavid Empire um, at the Battle of Chalderon, which is a very famous battle in Middle Eastern history, probably the largest two armies um, to face off uh, up until that point. Um, the Safavids are his enemies to the east in you know, what we think of as, as Iran today, um, a Shiite Muslim empire uh, that rose up around 1500. Um, and, and he deals them a massive blow at Chalderon that sets the Safavids back uh, many years and, and makes it clear that, that Salim is the major player in the, in the region. Um, he makes that even clearer in 1516 and 1517 when he um, completely conquers the Mamluk Empire, which is based in Cairo. So he marches his forces um, uh, from Istanbul all the way to Cairo. Uh, this is the longest um, military expedition that an Ottoman sultan ever undertook. Um, and uh, the Mamluk Empire ruled all of North Africa. Um, most of, again, what we think of as the Middle East today. So Syria, um, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Iraq, uh, Saudi Arabia, and then North Africa, as I said, and obviously Egypt. So he gains all of that territory. Um, it puts the empire for the first time in its history in the Indian Ocean world through the Red Sea, mm -hmm. which is obviously very important for trade. Um, it wins him, quite importantly, Mecca and Medina uh, to give him the claim to being the global caliph. The caliph in Islam is technically the ruler who controls Mecca and Medina. So up until that point, um, it was the Mamluk Empire. Um, Salim is the first sultan who can claim um, to be uh, the caliph um, um, in a real way. Um, and he returns to Istanbul only in 1518. Um, he spends a few months in the palace. Um, there's a plague epidemic in um, Istanbul in those years. 
And as we all have learned quite well, one of the ways of dealing with um, an epidemic is to run away from it. So he goes to um, the Imperial Hunting Lodge um, in Edirne, which is um, further in the Balkans, um, and uh, spends the rest of his life in Edirne. Uh, by the way, uh, viewers can send in your questions, and they get forwarded to me. And one question has already come in. Wasn't Salim's mother Slavic? Where was she from? So as best we know, she was, from, she was born in Albania. Albania, okay. Yeah, in the 1540s. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I like the way one of the things you do in the book is to deal with alternative histories. And you ask the question of, what would happen? What would have happened if Salim had not died of the plague at the age of 49? Um, what do you think would have happened? Right. Um, counterfactuals are always hard for historians. Um, I will do my best. Um, I think, you know, one of the big questions that I ask in the book is, would he have continued West in North Africa? <laughs> Morocco is never conquered by the Ottomans in, in any year. Um, we have some indication that Salim had some interests. He sends a kind of uh, trial expedition west from Algeria. He controls Algeria. Uh, Morocco is, you know, notoriously difficult to conquer. Um, the Spanish try to conquer it. Um, the Ottomans try to conquer it in this period. It, it's ruled by an independent, uh, an independent polity. So I think that's a major sort of what if question uh, that I, you know, I, I sort of pose, but of course can't answer um, in, in, in the book. I think, you know, we can imagine what might have happened, right? It, it, it gives the Ottomans a foothold on the Atlantic. Um, it has major implications for, um, for Spain, obviously. And then um, they might have been the ones to, to come across the Atlantic. Well, I guess Columbus already had done so, but uh, maybe they would have taken South America. I don't know. That's right. That's right. I mean, another, another in, the, in the other direction um, question that I pose and, um, you know, that we will never know the answer to is um, moving uh, further in the Indian Ocean world. So um, Salim's forces reach as far south as Yemen. Um, what would have happened had um, interests um, in the Indian Ocean world, um, you know, been been more of an important part of, of the Ottoman Empire in this period. Would, would they have moved further south in Africa, for example, um, from, from Egypt and then across the Red Sea from Yemen? Um, these are all, again, um, what if sort of questions. A another way maybe of, you know, had Salim survived, uh, another way of thinking about that question is that he in some ways does survive in the sense that he sets up his son, who is perhaps the most famous Ottoman sultan, um, Suleiman the Magnificent, um, Selim sets him up um, to really be the ruler he becomes. He saves him from the succession crisis that took so much of Selim's energy and life. Um, Suleiman is the only surviving son that Selim has. Um, the territorial expansion that, that Selim achieved is a large part of Suleiman's power. He's able to extract more and more tax revenue. It makes him a larger player on the world stage that, that all powers kind of have to wrestle with. Um, so I think that that's not something that um, historians have paid a lot of attention to, is thinking about the ways in which Salim, as I said, set up, sets up Suleiman. And that's one of the arguments I make in the book, that we should really pay attention to Salim, perhaps more than Suleiman, in fact. Um, we have a viewer asking a question that Salim conquered such a great deal of territory. Was that because he was surrounded by weak states or because he had a really strong army? And tell us what an army looked like at that point. Uh, what were their arms? They had cavalry and foot soldiers. Mm -hmm. How powerful were their weapons and so forth? Mm -hmm. Right. So the first question, I, I would say it's a combination of the two. Um, so the Safavids, for example, are rather weak in their, in their early years. He leads a campaign um, against Georgia in the Caucasus, and the Georgians are rather weak um, in this period. Um, the Mamluks are quite strong, um, and 
you know, one, one of the arguments I make in the book is that um, Salim is a very militarily aggressive sultan in contrast to his father. His father is very interested in peace and stability, maintaining relations with foreign powers. Salim um, is posted as when he is made governor, um, he's posted to the frontier of the empire in the east on the Black Sea. Um, his father did that to make clear that, that he had no interest in Salim becoming sultan. He puts him you know, in the in the furthest reaches of the empire where he can't get to the capital very easily. Um, but because he's, he's on the border, and we see this in lots of um, um, historical situations, um, he has a very aggressive military outlook that you have to strike at your enemies first, um, be aggressive rather than defensive. And he brings that um, to his rule once he becomes Sultan and strikes out at enemies left and right. Domestic enemies, he leads, um, one of the worst uh, domestic massacres in Ottoman history of 40,000 um, Ottoman Shiites. Um, that remains until the end of the 19th century, one of the worst massacres in Ottoman history. And then, and then you know, most strikingly against uh, the Mamluks. In terms of the army and its arms and how it functioned, um, the Ottomans had, had gunpowder, um, had cannons and um, and guns, and use that to great effect against the Safavids, for example. Um, quite importantly, something we might not think about immediately is that Ottoman horses are, are trained around gunfire, so it doesn't startle them in the way that it startled the Safavids' um, horses. The Mamluks also had cannons. Um, also important is uh, the structure of the Ottoman military, the famous Janissaries. So um, we spoke a little bit about how concubines came into the empire as slaves. The same is true of Janissary soldiers. During raids, um, usually in the Balkans, young boys were captured by the Ottomans, um, brought into Ottoman territory, converted to Islam, trained in the military arts, given lots of advantages in life to become a military elite. This is how the Ottomans staff their military very quickly and create loyalty um, in the ranks. And this is something that, um, you know, contrasted with uh, European armies. So Machiavelli, for example, is very envious of um, um, the Janissaries. He says the Ottomans have a standing army. Anytime they need to, um, you know, pitch battle, the army is ready to go. They're professional. They know how to use their arms. They know how to march. Whereas in Europe, every time, you know, a sovereign wants to wage war, he has to raise an army of irregulars um, that takes time. They're not very professional. They don't know how to use arms, etc. cetera. Um, so the Ottoman military is, is part of this um, sense of contrast between, um, you know, a set of uh, disparate, uh, tessellated uh, polities in Europe, very small states um, disconnected, and this gargantuan Ottoman state in the east with territory and a standing army. Uh, a viewer is asking, if you had to make a comparison to today's world, which country today plays the closest role to the Ottomans empire, or the Ottoman empire's role then, and which countries today play the closest role to uh, Europe? in trying to resist it, Western Europe. Interesting. Um, well, you know, I think, I think there isn't a, a single country that, um, you know, plays a role that the Ottomans did. Um, you know, empire is not, um, is not the, the, the reigning mode of politics today. It's the nation state. Um, and that's a very different understanding of geopolitics. Um, of course, Turkey in some ways has inherited um, the Ottoman past in a very real way, but so have you know, the 33 nation states that were once a part of the Ottoman Empire. So um, you see this in cuisine in the Balkans, for example, um, in, um, in Arabic in Syria and in Egypt, there's lots of Ottoman Turkish words still to this day. Um, so the, those legacies are very, very real, but I don't think there's a single sort of geopolitical um, uh, player in the world, in the Middle East, that, that, that plays a role 
akin to what the Ottomans did before. I mean, what we do see today is more a rivalry for that kind of regional hegemony between, say, Turkey, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. It changes in, in different moments. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about what goes into the writing of a book like this. When you're planning out how you're going to tell this story, what are the considerations in your mind that make you able to succeed in narratively hooking a reader like me who's not necessarily that interested in this time and place to begin with? Right. So um, I really wanted to tell a story about the Ottomans and global history, the importance of the Ottomans to understanding our world. Mm -hmm. um, one could do that in a very dry manner of running through a set of events and showing how the Ottomans were a part of that. Um, Salim is uh, in some ways my Trojan horse to allow me to do mm -hmm. that. Uh, the book is built around his life. Um, for those of you who have uh, looked at the book at all, um, it moves chronologically from his birth through his death. Um, but he um, and his empire but you weave are, in an awful lot of stuff around that. Yeah. Exactly. Th that's just what I was going to say. He and his empire in those years, in those 50 years, are involved in all of these, these world-shaping events. So we talked about 1492. You know, I spent a lot of time in the book. We might not have time to get into it tonight on the Protestant Reformation and the role of Salim and the Ottomans in that, um, in the rise of, of, of commercial relations and early capitalism. Um, and so, so Salim is, you know, I walk with him. I sometimes leave him on the road and go in other directions and then come back and pick him up and we continue our walk together. Um, but I really wanted this to be an engaging story that would insert the Ottomans into these large stories that we think we know very well, something like 1492. So we all know uh, that Columbus um, sailed in 1492. We, we don't often think about why he's going west, right? It monopolies over trade yeah. that the Ottomans yeah. and the Mamluks controlled. Um, yeah. So, so in terms of narrative strategy, it was to um, to make things that we think are quite familiar a little strange again um, by showing the uh, the Ottoman role in in those historical events. And what are your sources for the raw materials through which you uh, tell the story? Uh, how much of the court correspondence letters survived? Did people keep diaries to write chronicles? What sort of stuff is there and what languages is it in? Right. So we have um, bureaucratic documents uh, that Salim's government produced. Um, these would be orders. These would be, um, you know, tax receipts, that kind of government bureaucratic material written in Ottoman Turkish. Large quantities of this stuff? There's, there are large quantities of this that survive in the Topkapa Palace archives, so in the Ottoman Palace archives. Mm -hmm. um, we also have um, chronicles from that period. Um, the chronicles that we have are both, uh, the ones that I use are those written, for example, in Damascus or in Cairo by those who experienced the Ottoman conquest of those places. And then we also have chronicles that are written later about Salim. And there's a, actually a genre um, known as the Book of Salim that's produced, um, um, you know, a century after his life that are basically hagiographies of Salim, written in a period in which um, the Ottomans were looking back on their past and wanting to create a kind of glorious um, narrative of, of events for themselves. So I use these sources. One has to be very judicious when using something like the Salim Nama to, to kind of to keep the, the, the wheat and the chaff separate. Um, the, the other sort of major contribution that I make in the book in terms of source material is, is really combining sources. So combining the Spanish sources yeah. um, uh, of Columbus and Cortez. I use Venetian sources um, about trade and then also just kind of geopolitical relations between, um, between the Italian city-state and the Ottomans. Luther... Uh, for example, writes an enormous amount about the Ottomans. Um, so it's it's really a, a, a collection, a, a pretty wide collection of sources. And I think the fact that we have such a wide collection of sources is indication in and of itself of the reach of the Ottoman Empire.
In fact, speaking of Luther, you at one point almost give the Ottomans credit for sparking the Reformation. Uh, That's right. By right. right. So um, Luther writes a great deal about 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 the uh, the Turks, um, and there 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 are two claims I make for for the Ottoman role in the Reformation. One is is um, the theological one. So Luther's very interested in the fact that there are no icons in Islam, the iconoclasm mm -hmm. of Islam, the anti-clericalism of Islam, which he contrasts with the Catholic Church, of course, that, you know, this is this um, stale bureaucracy. They only care about money and, and their own administrative positions, and they've lost sight of, of, of God and of prayer and of the soul. Um, and he sees um, in Islam some echoes of a different way of being in the world. Um, the, the other contribution of the Ottomans to the Reformation is, is Selim. Because of his territorial expansion in 1516, 1517, once Luther gets going, um, Catholic powers are too busy, um, you know, worried about the Ottomans um, to send any kind of military force to deal with um, to, to, to deal with Luther and his, um, and his followers. Um, so those are, those are the, the two arguments I make about the Reformation. Interesting. So if it wasn't for the Ottomans, Ferdinand, Isabella, and other people might have sent, sent troops to suppress Luther. I guess they were a little earlier than Luther, but uh, yeah, interesting. Right. What made you interested in this period? Uh, and because this your most of your books have been about Ottoman Turkey, right? Right. Um, I was interested in this period in specific because of, of this moment of 15, 16, 15, 17, which was such a huge um, moment of territorial expansion. Um, you know, it's, it's akin to the, to the British win, winning India. I mean, it's, it's a huge, huge moment. And we didn't, really have a good understanding of its um, consequences, what resulted from this huge territorial expansion. I think in part because it's the end of the Mamluk Empire, and so Mamluk historians tend to sort of end their story there and don't really dwell on it, um, and Ottoman historians tend to begin their story there. Um, but I really wanted to understand it on its own terms. Um, so that's what led me to this story. Um, and because it's Selim who's leading this um, conquest, you know, I, I went in other directions to fill out the story of his life and where he came from and what led him to do this and, and its consequences. Okay. That's, I think it's time for me to stop and turn to questions that are coming in from viewers here, although I have a lot more of my own. One of the questions is, how did the Ottomans react to the fall of the Muslim communities in Andalusia? I presume this is a, 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 a referring to the Muslims as well as the Jews who were forced out of Spain in 1492. Did the Ottomans try to help them in any way? Right. Um, so we do have some evidence uh, that uh, the Ottomans um, send at least some sort of reconnaissance forces to try to determine the situation of, uh, of the Muslims of Spain um, right before 1492. Um, they had chipped away at some Spanish and Portuguese holdings in North Africa. Um, for the Spanish, this notion that the Ottomans are somehow keeping tabs um, on um, their Muslim subjects in Iberia is very scary. Um, it, they see them as a fifth column in, in Spain. Um, this is in contrast to the Jews of Spain, for example. Um, Jews don't have an external state that is threatening to support the Jews of Spain in the way that um, Spanish Muslims do. Um, they were rooted out also at the same time. That's right. That's right. So the history of, of the Jews of Spain is, is quite different. In 1492, uh, the Jews are expelled. Um, Muslims are not expelled um, in earnest for another hundred years from Spain, although some are expelled in 1492. But the Jews, um, you know, to a person, if the if the the Catholic Spaniards had their way, were expelled um, in 1492. Many go to North Africa. Many go to Portugal. Many go to Italy. Eventually, um, 
a large number of Iberian Jews end up in Salonika. Which is in the Ottoman Empire. Right. In the Ottoman Empire. And wasn't that the largest Jewish city on earth at that point? Yeah. That's right. So, so a few decades after 1492, um, Thessaloniki, um, today's Thessaloniki, Salonika then, um, became the largest uh, Jewish city in the world, the only Jewish majority city um, until the 20th century. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, in a moment, to get back to your sort of question about tolerance and minorities, um, in a moment in which Spain is expelling its minority religious communities, many of them are finding um, their place in the Ottoman Empire. Interesting. Okay, a couple of other questions that have come in from viewers here. One of them is, wasn't the level of technology such as guns and ships uh, important to Salim's conquest, that he had superiority in these things over his enemies? Um, so, Ships are, are not essential for Salim since most of his conquests are, are overland. Um, he does have some replenishment ships that meet him in Alexandria after he conquers the Mamluk Empire. Um, but these are, you know, ships just to haul grain and cargo and arms and things. They're not particularly sophisticated. Um, there are some historians of an earlier generation who put a lot into... Uh, the Ottomans' use of gunpowder and firearms um, in their conquest of the Mamluk Empire. That's been revised slightly over the past couple of decades. Um, the Mamluks also had gunpowder technology and used it um, to great effect. So it's, it's not clear that that's the, the thing that turned um, the tide in the, in the Ottomans' favor. Okay, another question that's come in here is, is it historically accurate to refer to the Op Ottoman Empire as a Sunni state and the Safavids as a Shia state, how much are our understandings of them limited by our modern language and way of looking at these things? Right, that's a great question and, and a good point. Um, so to call the Ottomans um, a Sunni state is impossible, I think, before 1517, when the vast majority of people who live there are Christian. Um, I think one can make a claim to use those terms after 1517 for the following reason, um, that both of those states, and we, we might make similar arguments about Catholicism and Protestantism in, in Europe later, um, both of those states self-identify themselves as Sunni mm -hmm. and Shiite states. So we see this, for example, in the exchange of letters between Salim and the Safavid leader Ismail. Um, they sort of curse each other back and forth calling each other epithets um, that have to do with being Sunnis or being Shiites. Um, in neither empire, um, um, or I should say in both empires, there are huge non-Sunni in the Ottoman case, non-Shiite in the Safavid case um, communities. Um, so we always have to keep that in mind. When I use those terms, I'm really speaking about the, the language of political legitimacy that, that the sovereigns use. Um, and it's very important for them as a means of contrasting themselves from the other. Uh, one question I have, towards the end of your book, you question the idea that there never was a reformation in Islam. And you sort of give Salim credit for having some sort of a reformation. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm trying to be provocative by using that language. Um, what I mean by that is that because of his huge territorial expansion in 1517, he adapts the institutions of Islam to um, his imperial rule. So the telltale example of this for me is the imperial court. So the imperial court um, um, are, um, the, the, the empire's courts are uh, venues of legal disputation spread out across the empire. So every small town, major city would have a court. These are places where people register marriages and divorces, property transactions, thefts, all kinds of things. Um, these are institutions in which technically Sharia, so uh, uh, Islamic law, is, is the law of those courts. Um, Salim, though, uses these courts really as kind of Ottoman embassies in 
in these different regions. So they, they take on less of a kind of Islamic law bent and more of a kind of um, um, promulgation of rule role in these in these um, in these locations. So when I use the term reformation to refer to Salim, that's really what I'm referring to. That he uses these institutions that are formerly institutions of Islamic law for a um, means of kind of mundane rule. Okay. Uh, a couple other questions have come in here. One is, uh, some historians say that the Sunni-Shiite split is based on an Arab-Persian split. Mm -hmm. You speak about how the Orthodox Christians, how Orthodox Christian the Safayid Empire population was. So maybe this split is not so clean for millennia and is perhaps healable? I'm reading the question. I'm not completely sure I understand what the person is asking. But maybe you yeah, I don't fully understand either. I mean, to, to the main, what I take to be the main point of the question is, you know, it, is it healable as the, as the questioner asks? Of course, uh, you know, every, every conflict is, is produced historically and can be changed uh, through, you know, uh, po political, uh, economic, social, cultural uh, means. So I don't think any conflict around the world is, um, is you know, primordial and eternal. Another question here is, you've made a good case for Salim's importance, but why did you choose him instead of Suleiman the Magnificent? <laughs> I sometimes get questions like that too. You know, why do you write the book you did instead of the one that I would have liked you to have written? Right, right. Um, you know, there's a good amount on both Salim and Suleiman. Uh, there's more on Suleiman. Um, again, I, I, I think that the things that Salim did during his reign, short, to be clear, um, were, were more impactful than what Suleiman did. Suleiman um, didn't expand the empire as much as his father did. Um, he didn't uh, bring in as many new subjects into the empire as Salim did. Um, he didn't uh, sort of have a, 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 a succession crisis that rocked the empire to its core in the way that Salim did. Um, Salim is the one who makes the, the, the empire uh, the most important Muslim state in the world. He is the first Ottoman caliph. He gives the empire the shape it will maintain until its end in World War I. So for, for many reasons, I think Salim is, is more important than, than Suleiman. And that's, you know, that's, that's a provocative point I make in the book, but one that I, I stand by. And I, you know, I'm interested to hear what people have to say about that. Yeah. A follow-up to that question is another one that's come in to please give a further comparison between Salim and Suleiman, particularly in view of creating laws, education systems, that kind of thing. Right. Suleiman yes. reigned for much longer, right? Suleiman is the longest reigning sultan in Ottoman history, 46 years. Wow. Right. And yeah, Suleiman was only eight years, Eight, right? eight, right. Um, so Suleiman, his epithet in, in Turkish is the lawgiver. We call him the magnificent, but in Turkish he's called the lawgiver, precisely as the questioner is, is pointing to, because he promulgates um, a lot of law books, um, a lot of fatwas are, are put out during his reign. He expands the court system that I was talking about before um, along some of the same lines that Salim did. Um, Salim didn't have the time on the throne to do some of those things. But um, as I was saying before, I think it's, it, Suleiman could not have done those things without, without Salim's mm -hmm. territorial expansion. That's really the thing that makes Salim the most important uh, um, Ottoman Sultan, I argue. And I would say 1517 um, um, is, mu is a much more important year than, than 1453. Um, you know, if, if, if people who aren't Ottoman historians know a date in Ottoman history, it's usually 1453 when the Ottomans conquer Constantinople. Obviously a very, very important moment um, in, in world history. Um, but for understanding the Ottomans and their longevity and their power in global politics, um, 1517 is is far and that away a much more important the conquest year. of Cairo and that's right of the Mamluk Empire yeah. right which took them all the way to Mecca essentially right yes yeah yeah um, another question here is what about the Ottoman conflict with Russia when did that start okay um, good question. Um, 
the the Ottomans and it, it, it's unclear what 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 one means by the Ottoman Russian conflict. Um, the sort of telltale moment of conflict is the 18th century, um, but there are early, early, much earlier moments in which the Ottomans um, and the Russians are uh, butting heads, and that that usually takes place in the Black Sea, um, sometimes in the Caucasus, but usually in the Black Sea. There is a moment during Selim's life when he's brought in very close contact with Russian forces, and that's um, right before his run to the throne um, in 1510 and 1511, when Suleiman, his son, is posted as the governor of Crimea, so in the northern uh, mm -hmm. Black Sea. Um, and it's there that... Um, the Salim and Suleiman, Salim goes with Suleiman to this posting and they, um, they meet the Garai Khans who are um, descendants of Mongols and other Central Asian forces who are the ruling family in Crimea. Um, but there are also Russian forces there and they, um, both the Khans and the Ottomans um, in Crimea uh, have several slave raids further north into Russia and what is today Ukraine. Um, and, and that becomes a major source for slaves um, into the Ottoman Empire. So, for example, uh, um, Roxolana, who becomes um, um, the he, first the concubine, then the wife of Suleiman, is most likely um, a, a um, Ukrainian or Russian concubine who's captured in one of those slave trades um, in that period. Wow. I think we've got time just for one last question, which has come in here, which is this. Uh, President Erdogan of Turkey seems to be erasing the secularization of Turkey that happened under Ataturk and continued for some time after him. As a historian, when you look back over mm -hmm. the centuries in that part of the world, was a secular society in what is today Turkey something of an an anomaly? In the, his, in the history of that, of the Eastern Mediterranean? Um, sure, yeah. I mean, I would say secular society was an anomaly everywhere um, until the 19th century. Um, mm -hmm. In Europe as well. <laughs> in Europe as well. Um, I think it's quite interesting to see, um, and this, this sort of brings us for full circle to some of the resonances of the story of Selim today, it's quite interesting to see Erdogan's embrace of Selim. Hmm. Um, he, um, he very much sees Selim as um, his progenitor more than other Ottoman sultans. And you see this, for example, very clearly. Um, there are three bridges over the famous Bosphorus Straits that connect Asia and Europe. The only connectors, physical connectors between those continents. Um, the first bridge is just known as the Bosphorus Bridge. The second bridge was named after Mehmet the Conqueror, the conqueror of Constantinople. Erdogan built a third bridge and he named it after Selim. Hmm. He could have named it after anyone. Why did he name it after Selim? Selim, um, for all the reasons that I've been discussing, um, Erdogan sees him as a, as a projection of Turkish power into the world, as a regional hegemon, right, who lashed out against the Safavids, Iran, um, who conquered the Arab world. We could call that Saudi Arabia for Erdogan. Um, uh, he is someone who unites the Sultanate and the Caliphate. Um, given Erdogan's Islamist politics, uh, Salim is very convenient for him to make this point that we have a precedent in Turkish history of a very strong, um, um, you know, political leader who was also a religious leader. Um, so Salim is very convenient for him in all in all kinds of ways, um, and and he's done a lot to kind of revive um, Salim's reputation, as he's done for for many of of many figures from the Ottoman past. For much of the 20th century, um, uh, the Turkish Republic has done a lot of work to distance itself from the Ottoman past. Mm. The language reform, um, the uh, ban on public displays of religiosity, um, moving away from the past, always to the future, towards Europe, modern modernization, etc. cetera. Um, Erdogan is, is unique for many reasons, one of which is that he very tightly aligns himself with the Ottoman past. He refers to himself and his political party as the grandchildren 
of the Ottoman Empire, which is interesting because he jumps over the, the previous generation, his quote unquote father, um, to the Ottomans. So um, skipping over the Republic straight back to the Ottoman Empire. Um, so Selim is, is, understanding Selim is very, very important for understanding Erdogan's politics today. Well, that's yet another reason to read uh, this fascinating book. I'm afraid our time is up. Uh, thank you very much, Alan. It's been a pleasure doing this. And thank all of you who tuned in. Uh, and this ends another event at the Commonwealth Club in its 118th year of having discussions like this. So we hope you'll join us again. Thank you all. <laughs>